Can you hear me now? Oh, We're yeah. about to start, so please take your seat. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mayrin Ramos from the Service Employees International Union. Uh, SEIU represents 28,000 uh, workers in Puerto Rico. And I'd like to uh, welcome all of you, those that are testifying um, today, and uh, those in the audience. Um, I'd like to start uh, by introducing uh, Ranking Member Raul Grijalva uh, before he goes out um, with his vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, welcome the panel. Thank you very much for the time uh, for this briefing. Uh, as we all know, last year, uh, Congress fi finally started to address uh, Puerto Rico's economic, financial, and indeed humanitarian crisis with the passage of the, the Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, PROMESA. The process didn't end there. Uh, we are here today with this, at this briefing uh, because, uh, quite frankly, congressional action and federal assistance are still needed. Puerto Rico's children continue to be uh, the victims of a crisis that they did not create, a financial crisis they did not create. More than half of Puerto Rico's children live in poverty. The island's poverty rate is about 46%. Unemployment is close to 12%, about 11.5. And people continue to leave every month in alarming numbers. Yesterday's PROMESA automatic stay on credit lawsuits against the island expired. We're concerned that an avalanche of predatory lawsuits by, by vulture funds could turn Puerto Rico's recession into a depression. That concern is well-founded. A report that Democratic staff of the House Committee on Natural Resources released in 2015 revealed how certain hedge funds used unusual financial leverage to force Puerto Rico into deep budget cuts and higher bond repayments even as the, ter as the territory faced economic collapse. Puerto Rico has more than 70 billion in public debt, debt or about 20,000 per resident. Uh, the island's deep-rooted economic and fiscal crisis cannot be solved through austerity economics or austerity only. The Puerto Rican people have endured more than a decade of harsh anti-worker austerity measures, including policies that disproportionately burden the island's low-income residents. Over the past few years, the government has laid off thousands of workers, raised tuition at public universities, shut down K-12 schools, slashed retirement benefits, and limited collective bargaining. These radicals, radical and unpopular steps have not helped the Puerto Rican people or made the Puerto Rican economy more attractive place to invest. Uh, both Congress and the Oversight Board have roles to play in, in, the, in resolving Puerto Rico's humanitarian, economic, and financial crisis. The island is in dire need of powerful economic stimulus, quality jobs, higher wages, and salary. It needs help from Congress to achieve Medicaid and Medicare parity and obtain exemptions from restrictive trade laws. There is no path for recovery and economic growth without significant debt restructuring plan. When Congress enacted PROMESA, it included a restructuring process to Title to III of the Act. Creditors, especially at certain hedge funds, have stopped at nothing to try to block our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico from exercising these legal rights. I think it is unethical for any person or group to attempt to deny the island access to promised debt relief process that was guaranteed under the Act. Before we begin today's forum, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the International Workers' Days that happened uh, and the thousands of Puerto Rican workers that marched yesterday against austerity measures and the elimination of public worker benefits. If, as we continue to work to strengthen the Puerto Rico economy and the well-being of the people, it's extremely important to preserve existing labor and workplace protections and collective bargaining rights. Equally as important is the need to address the ill-conceived and misguided anti-worker provisions included in PROMESA. As we went forward in a response to an urgency with PROMESA, the issue of uh, those provisions, bitter pill to swallow, but feeling that we needed to take a step forward, and as if restructuring occurred, then we could revisit it. Well, it's time to revisit, which had, uh, which was in the legislation in the first place, uh, and it 
I think all it does is worsen the disparities between Puerto Rico and the U.S. mainland. So the, the talk today is about what Congress needs to do, uh, what the board needs to do in order to look at the economic picture in a comprehensive way. Uh, and in looking at it a comprehensive way, we must include the workforce, we must include their protections, and a workforce that is protected, feels respected in terms of their ability to collectively bargain, to deal with grievances, to deal with their, with their working conditions, benefit packages, I think is a workforce that can be instrumental in helping uh, Puerto Rico not only survive its crisis, but go beyond it and start a real move toward significant economic development, retention of investment, and retention of people within its own island. That would be the goal. And I, I'm very, uh, very gratified that you have chosen to come and do this briefing. Congress needs it. The minutes and the information from this meeting will be made available to all our colleagues as we go forward. And I apologize, uh, my colleagues uh, on the majority who run the House don't ask us when they can have votes or not, so I am uh, obligated to excuse myself and be back later. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yesterday, more than tens of, tens of thousands of Puerto Ricans took on the street to express frustration over austerity, not two or three years of austerity, but 10 years of austerity. In the last two months, they have seen even more cuts to labor benefits, possibly dismantling the healthcare system, the potential loss of accreditation of our, our flagship university for lack of funding, and a public health crisis with the Zika virus. Little kids now have to travel over an hour to get to school because their local schools have closed. And the U.S. have sent a fiscal board to fix this situation. And in reality, the board has had the effect of taking Puerto Rico back to the 1930s when strikes and unrest rocked a small island. Luckily, we have people here in Washington who do not want to repeat of the 1930s, like ranking member Grijalva. He's providing in this panel the opportunity to hear firsthand the, re the relentless austerity measures, the government of Puerto Rico ongoing debt nego negotiations, and the need to safeguard acc accrued pension benefits. Also, we're going to hear about the cause of human crisis and the response of local politicians to this crisis. I use the plural because it is easy to focus on the debt, on the one big number, but there are millions of people whose lives will be affected by those numbers that have faces names, families. Included in those numbers are members of my own family who live in Puerto Rico and live through this crisis, plural, every day. You can hear for yourself what the real cause of austerity look like and how it can impact real human beings. The tragedy of this is that neither the fiscal control board imposed by PROMESA nor local politicians actually have all of the tools needed to fix this humanitarian, cri humanitarian crisis. Why? because neither local leaders nor the fiscal control board have a will to audit the audit. Second, neither the local leaders nor the fiscal control board have access to any economic resources to stimulate the economy. PROMESA operates on the false premise that the only budget that works for the people of Puerto Rico is an accountant's budget, not people's budget. It is a budget meant to ensure that one class gets paid and another does not. We have seen this before when the government of Puerto Rico laid off 30,000 public workers and teachers had to clean up schools because the janitors had been laid off. Again, I want to acknowledge that uh, everyone does not think like this. And I want to thank uh, the visionary Raul Grijalva, who knows that a public budget is meant to help people, not spreadsheets. Representative Grijalva is bringing the opportunity to discuss Puerto Rico in today's panel. With the same inclusiveness, he has focused on diversifying the environmental movement beyond traditional activist groups, holding a number of Capitol Hill roundtables with women groups, Latin organizations, Native Americans, tribes, and other communities, traditionally underrepresented in environmental decisions making. We're going to start um, today's panel with 
Mr. Eric Lecomte, Executive Director of Jubilee USA Network. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the chair and members of the committee. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. This Bible verse opens a statement made one week ago today by both the Catholic Archbishop of San Juan de Puerto Rico and the Evangelical Head of Puerto Rico's Bible Society. Archbishop Gonzalez and Reverend Martinez further note in their statement, new austerity programs are being forced on our people and we must now receive the debt relief we are promised. It is immoral and unethical for any person or group to attempt to deny our people access to promise debt relief processes. Last year, we supported the passage of emergency debt crisis legislation because it promised a process that could restructure 100% of our debt. Now our people need that promise fulfilled. The Archbishop and Reverend Martinez are right. A promise was made and the promise must be kept. My organization, Jubilee USA, represents national U.S. religious bodies, congregations, and institutions. Our founders and members range from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops to American Jewish World Service to Islamic Relief to most of the national Protestant denominations. We count 650 faith communities as partners across our great country. We focus on how the most vulnerable are impacted by global issues such as trade, debt, corruption, and taxes. We've worked with Congress and every administration on bipartisan solutions on these issues for 20 years. Because of the agreements that we forged with Republican and Democratic leadership, our financial system is more responsible, transparent, and developing countries have seen over $130 billion in re debt relief to build schools and medical centers. Last year, the National Latino Evangelical Coalition, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Catholic Charities USA, and Jubilee USA supported the promise by supporting the PROMESA legislation that the Archbishop and Reverend Martinez referenced. Now Puerto Rico undergoes additional austerity without receiving the debt relief it was promised. Puerto Rico still awaits the activation of Congress's promise, the Title III debt restructuring process. This is an orderly, comprehensive process that would continue structured negotiations, protect essential services, and promote transparency. This morning, the protections you created, Congress created on debt lawsuits expired, and Puerto Rico is now being sued by some of its creditors. It is incumbent on Puerto Rico's governor and oversight board to authorize the Title III process as soon as possible. Puerto Rico will not see economic growth until the debt is restructured and the austerity is getting worse. By the time Puerto Rico had announced almost two years ago that the debt was unpayable, more than 200 schools had closed, vital medical services were cut, and hundreds of thousands of people left the island for the mainland, as is their right as American citizens. The government of Puerto Rico complied with PROMESA and put in place a fiscal plan that cuts monies to the University of Puerto Rico, further cuts health care access to vital services, cuts pensions, and freezes and reduces public sector salaries. While we are grateful for the efforts of Puerto Rico's government and oversight board to ensure some protections are in place for vulnerable communities, we must acknowledge that austerity continues to slow the path for economic growth. Because the problem will get worse before it gets better, we will continue to see massive migration from the island to the mainland over the next decade. This means more schools will close and public services and public coffers will further diminish. The promise of debt relief must be fulfilled. Congress should do nothing to alter, harm, or delay the Title III process. We support the Governor and Oversight Board to immediately activate the debt restructuring process. Pope Francis, the Holy Father, 
and the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, have both noted that situations like that of Puerto Rico require the option of bankruptcy. We also believe it is incumbent on Congress to move forward bipartisan efforts on responsible lending and borrowing. This helps us prevent the next crisis in Puerto Rico and all around the world. We are grateful for the work of Puerto Rico's Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez and Republican and Democratic leadership for moving forward health care financing for Puerto Rico. This is a good first step, and it is essential that Congress can also facilitate a long-term solution to financing health care parity for American citizens that live in Puerto Rico. We would also encourage Congress to adopt the other bipartisan recommendations made by the Congressional Task Force on Economic Growth in Puerto Rico. Chair and distinguished members, I am grateful that I was invited to testify today. I began with the words of Archbishop Gonzalez and Reverend Martinez, and I will end with them. We continue to hold in prayer everyone who is affected by this crisis, whether they are our creditors or our children. We invite prayers for all of those who are impacted. We pray that together we can achieve solutions that protect the dignity and welfare of every person impacted by the crisis. Thank you. Our next panel, panelist is Simon Johnson. He's a professor of entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Thank you very much. Um, Puerto Rico faces one of the worst and most difficult debt crises uh, that we've ever seen in the United States and one of the worst that we've seen in recent years around the world. I would like to agree completely uh, with what Eric has said. I think Eric spoke in a compelling way from an ethical and religious perspective. I'm, I'm an economist. I'm a macroeconomist. I work on macroeconomics and finance and crisis around the world. I was previously chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. And I think that um, what Puerto Rico needs to do under these circumstances is to move forward with the framework uh, laid down by PROMESA. And I think this is the right course of action for three reasons. First, as Eric already articulated and Representative Grijalva also emphasized at the beginning, if you force austerity, meaning cuts in wages, cuts in pensions, other negative impact on ordinary residents of Puerto Rico, they're going to do what I would do and what I suggest you would do under the circumstances. They're going to leave. They're US citizens. They have the right to live and work anywhere in the 50 United States. If they move to the American mainland, they'll, I would think, for the most part, get a higher income, They'll have access to a stronger healthcare system, including because the public support is stronger in the 50 states than in Puerto Rico, and they'll qualify for the earned income tax credit. So to all creditors out there, let me point out that the tax base is mobile. The people can leave and will leave and are leaving Puerto Rico. And the harder you press and the more difficulties you make along the way, the more of your tax base will evaporate, and, and I really sincerely doubt that it's coming back anytime soon. So you're not gonna get repaid if you follow that course of action. Second, recognizing this, Congress last year, after a great deal of deliberation, including in this room, decided that the best way forward is to apply what works well in some aspects of American life, which is bankruptcy, court supervision for orderly restructuring of debt, preventing disruptive litigation, various forms of temporary restraining orders and so on, and to do this in a way that surely is not easy for anyone involved, but to do it with the involvement of an oversight board to bring greater scrutiny and hopefully some dispassionate analysis to the situation, but not to preempt the power of elected representatives in Puerto Rico, including the governor, who is an extremely influential person in this situation under the legislation. The congressional intent in PROMESA was clearly that there should be, if possible, a voluntary negotiation to restructure Puerto Rico's debts involving all of Puerto Rico's creditors in a fair manner, recognizing the difficult situation that Puerto Rico faces, and recognizing that they borrowed too much money. Frankly, and unfortunately, that hasn't happened. And the intent of PROMESA, again, was quite plain regarding such circumstances. Title III, bankruptcy, court supervised restructuring is now available. And I personally am waiting for that power to be invoked by some combination of the oversight board and, and the governor. 
This is clearly what the situation calls for. The path ahead is not going to be easy, and, and I am not at all advocating cuts and austerity as a strategy for economic growth, I think. Mr. Ramos made this point very effectively. However, I do urge everyone who has Puerto Rico's interests, best interests at heart to first do the debt restructuring, go through that process, write down the debts, put them on an affordable and sustainable basis, and then address the question of what additional resources you would like to put into the mix in order to finance schools, public infrastructure, essential central government services. The danger, I, I, I must stress, and the experience from around the world is that if you put additional resources on the table now, all that will happen, literally all that will happen, is the creditors will get higher payments. I don't think that's what you're trying to achieve. I think what you're trying to do, and I think what we're going to be speaking about here, is better ways to protect ordinary residents of Puerto Rico and to get back to economic growth. First, do the debt restructuring under the framework of PROMESA, court supervised process, get the debt down to a level that's sustainable and affordable under the circumstances, and then we should reconvene and really think hard about how to invest collectively in Puerto Rico's future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have now um, Iram Ramirez, the Secretary Treasurer of the Puerto Rico Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's grateful to be here. For me, it's important to be here uh, in behalf of my people, the people of Puerto Rico. I was born, raised, and live in the island of Puerto Rico. The island of Puerto Rico is a Caribbean paradise who has been transformed into a nightmare by the greed of hedge funds and by the bondholders. For the past 12 years, Puerto Rico has been on the austerity measures. Half of our population live on the poverty line. Almost 85,000 people is, are leaving the island every single year. Around the past 10 years, we have lost roughly half a million of our population. In Puerto Rico, a doctor lives every single day. Puerto Rico, just to give you an example, of my class, my class uh, high school class, 25 of our, we were 25, only seven remain on the island. Of my students at the university, almost half of them leave the island after they graduated if this is possible, if we have a university after this whole situation. In Puerto Rico, work, working people have received a huge burden of the austerity measures that have been imposed over the past 12 years. Under the pre pretext of dealing with the serious fiscal and economic situation, the government of the island has been hastily, ha hastily recently, re in recent years, the, the government administration have decreed a state of emergency to implement a series of measures that have not only been totally in, in, ineffective to attend the fiscal and economic crisis, but have put a, a huge burden on the back of the working people. Over the past seven years, we have seen measures that have laid off 30,000 people, public employees. We have, in some cases, both house, uh, spouses and wife, uh, both partners have been laid off without any consideration if they have children or any means of surviving. We have seen laws that have taken all of, all of our collective rights. Recently, as last week, in Puerto Rico, collective bargaining in the public sector has been outlawed. All our collective uh, contracts have been banned by the government, and new working conditions have been imposed. One of the most critical situations for us right now is the retirement plan. Just to give you an example, my mom is almost 70 years old and she cannot retire. She will be only receiving $1,000 a month, and if caught by 10%, she will only receive $900. Teachers in Puerto Rico does not receive social security, meaning that she will either have to pay their medicine, an electrical bill, a water bill that is going to be raised by PROMESA and by the Fiscal Control Board, or just to eat. The whole situation for Puerto Rican workers is dire. It's not like the, the states that we can move from state to state. We are forced to leave the island, leaving our families behind, leaving our culture behind to come to the states. 
Although it's true that we have that mobility, in Puerto Rico, nobody wants to leave the island. We are forced to leave because of the economic situation. If we take into consideration what, what is, has been proposed over the past 12 years is only been to self, serve the government and to pay the bondholders. Right now, the future report of Puerto Rico is on the hand of seven people who were undemocratically elected, not elected by the government, but appointed by the U.S. government. Only three of them are Puerto Ricans. Four of them are not Puerto Ricans. Most of them do not even live in the island of Puerto Rico. And they only represent the interests of the bondholders and the hedge funds. Even though Puerto Rican working people has been given a lot, the hedge fund has not received any cuts so far. The only people who can act right now are the Fiscal Control Board on PROMESA, who was created to deal with this situation and the bondholders and the hedge funds, but are not acting. Why they are not acting? Because two people on that group are part of the problem. They were part of the debt that was issued that is not being audited. Right now, the situation in Puerto Rico is that the government is not allowing labor organizations to participate in the hearings where these rights are taken away from us. We have lost 80 years of collective bargaining history in just two weeks. 80 years of protection for private sector workers has been taken away. The situation for us is not just of numbers. It's about people who are struggling to survive. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is Steve Greisberg. He's the Director of Research and Collective Bargaining Services for ASME International. Thanks, Marim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Um, I'm with AFSME. We're working closely with our partners at SEIU, UAW, and other unions on the islands uh, to address the crisis in Puerto Rico. And we throw around the term crisis an awful lot. Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, it is an appropriate uh, description of what we're facing. Uh, to put some of the numbers out there, which we haven't really dwelled on this, uh, this afternoon, Puerto Rico has about $75 billion in debt that it owes to bondholders. It has another 45 to $50 billion that it owes to pensioners. Uh, so these are employees who've worked and earned those pensions, but not only have they earned the pensions by virtue of service, they've actually contributed their own money to those pensions. And some of that money is at risk, as I'll explain in a bit. Uh, on top of that, as we went into this uh, situation, there was a structural budget imbalance of about $2 billion per budget year on about a budget of $16 billion worth of revenue. So you can see the, the, the extreme disparity between revenues and the financial need of the Commonwealth. Uh, but despite all of that, the problems facing Puerto Rico are not exclusively a budget problem. Uh, Myreem spoke earlier about looking at this as an accountant or looking at only the spreadsheet. Uh, the problems of Puerto Rico are really economic in origin. Uh, Puerto Rico has gone into a recession over 10 years ago, and they've never recovered. We've had negative economic growth. In other words, we've had economic uh, contraction for over 10 years. Uh, as the U.S. slowly emerged from the Great Recession in 2009, 2010, Puerto Rico never emerged. Investment is down, housing prices are in free fall. Uh, and until we can address those underlying causes, we're not going to be able to figure out a way out of our problems in Puerto Rico. And with that in mind, it's our view that the Oversight Board and the Governor must be completely fixated on the fact that this is an economic problem, not necessarily a budget problem. So we have to figure out a way to get economic growth. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the fiscal plan adopted uh, by the governor and the oversight board, that realization does not seem to be there. Uh, it cuts personnel expenses by $800 million in the next budget year that begins July 1st. Uh, that will undoubtedly lead to massive layoffs. Uh, there's an additional cut of another $800 million on top of this uh, already reduced level for the next fiscal year, beginning July 1st, 2018. Uh, the combination is about a $1.6 billion reduction in personnel costs. This is just personnel costs, which could lead to, in our view, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the island's for workforce being laid off, uh, the government workforce being laid off. Pensions are also addressed. 
Uh, pensions will be cut by an average 10%. Uh, that 10% was tripled by the Oversight Board. The governor had proposed pension reductions of 3%. Uh, and we believe the Oversight Board acted punitively in increasing that amount to 10%. Uh, the purpose of all of these cuts is pretty simple. This amount of money that's being saved was offered this past weekend by Governor Reisseo to the bondholders. He offered the general obligation bondholders and the COFINA bondholders the amount of money that he saved on the workers' backs. So it's fair to say that the government and the Oversight Board are asking the workers to bail out bondholders. And this will be to the detriment of the islands, it'll be to the detriment of services provided to the people who live there, and of course, it'll have a negative economic impact which will make the problems of Puerto Rico that much worse. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at and are increasingly concerned about is that our members have contributed $1.5 billion of their own money into a pension fund, into a retirement savings fund, that the government has spent. And that money is no longer there, and neither the Oversight Board nor the government of Puerto Rico has made any effort to address how these workers will be paid back their money. So it's an issue on the agenda, is what we're told, but yet the fiscal plan does not address it at all. So where do we go from here? Uh, in our view, as Professor Johnson said, we need to get into Title III. But also in our view, we need to fix the fiscal plan, which is the underlying blueprint for any kind of settlement or, orders or order coming out of Title III. The fiscal plan itself is defective, and on that, we have common cause with the bondholders. They believe it's defective for a whole range of different reasons than we do, uh, but the fiscal plan must be adjusted. It could either be adjusted before we get into Title III or subsequent to that filing, but we believe the debts need to be adjusted, that we can't ask workers to pay for bonds uh, that they had no, that they did not issue themselves. So on that, I want it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we have Frankie Miranda, Senior Vice President of the Hispanic Federation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Frankie Miranda. I'm the Senior Vice President of the Hispanic Federation, but I am also a native of Puerto Rico with both policy and intimate personal knowledge of the situation facing my family and my fellow countrymen. As Puerto Rico continues to endure a growing economic crisis that includes tens of billions in outstanding debt and pension obligations, major unemployment, massive austerity measures, crippling population drain, and an imminent healthcare shutdown, Puerto Ricans and Latinos on the mainland are looking to Washington to take a stronger action to assist millions of American citizens living on the island. Moreover, while there is blame to go around, Washington is complicit in this crisis, considering longstanding unfairness regarding federal tax, health care, and shipping cost policies. Puerto Rico should have not to stand alone in solving their problems. We acknowledge Congress' bipartisan accomplishment in passing PROMESA in 2016, a deeply flawed yet necessary law that grants crucial debt restructuring powers and starts the island on the road to fiscal stability. However, there is much more than Congress and the President must tackle before Puerto Rico truly gets a fair chance at economic recovery. The island's execution, exclusion from the Affordable Care Act, lack of health care cost reimbursement parity with the rest of the nation, and severe underfunding of Puerto Rico's healthcare system has placed it on a brink of a collapse and is already threatening patient care. We acknowledge the progress Congress has made in the recent federal budget deal that will extend approximately 300 million in short-term aid to permit healthcare coverage to continue on the island for a few months. However, Secretary Price 900 million requests is what ultimately is needed to sustain health care for the remainder of the fiscal year. In the medium term, Congress should bolster Puerto Rico health care safety net by eliminating the annual Medicaid Mi Salud funding cap on Puerto Rico in favor of funding based on federal medical assistance percentages per capita income. 
Puerto Rico received half the rate of federal healthcare funding while, while the island's U.S. citizens pay the same Medicare tax as mainland residents. This federal shortfall has led to a significant number of doctors moving to the U.S. where they are paid more for their services simply because mainland reimbursement rates are far superior. In the last five years, more than 3,000 medical professionals have left Puerto Rico. The healthcare industry represents 20% of Puerto Rico's GDP, amounting to $11 billion, and employs approximately 100,000 people. A collapse will not only jeopardize care for millions of U.S. citizens, but could result in a dramatic blow to Puerto Rico's already weakened economy. The absence of the IRS Section 936, the federal government should institute tax policies that foster economically diverse and living wage job creation. We support local government implementation of an earned income tax credit and an expanded child tax credit that rewards work and supplements earning to low-income workers in Puerto Rico. The earned income tax credit is already available to Americans living in the 50 states and the District of Columbia. At present, residents of Puerto Rico can qualify for the child tax credit only if they have three or more children, in contrast to low-income workers in the states who can obtain benefits with one or more children. The child tax credit should be extended to low-income all Puerto Rican parents with no added conditions. The Earned Income Tax Credit is a proven and effective anti-poverty measure to promote employment. It will create incentives for work and increase participation in the formal economy. At 40%, Puerto Rico has the lowest labor market participation in the United States and, its, and the territories, with participation rates are about two-thirds of the U.S. average. Low participation in formal economy stunts economy growth and undermines Puerto Rico's economy reform efforts. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, we are uh, expecting some members of Congress to join us. They're just finishing a series of votes. So while we wait for them, we'd like to entertain some questions from the audience to any of the panelists. Sir? Any of the panelists like to address that, Iram? <laughs> Obviously, as the labor movement has always said in Puerto Rico, the only way to have the government change its mind is by keeping the pressure on the streets. I think yesterday was, we were really successful in having the government finally realize that the people do not support the austerity measures. And there was a huge showing of almost 50,000 people demonstrating on the street across the island explaining and telling people that austerity measures are the worst kind of measures, that for the past 12 years we have been using those kind of measures and they are not giving out results. We need to audit the debt and restructure the debt. Thank you. I, I would point? just add, um, it's absolutely incumbent on the governor and oversight board to authorize the Title III bankruptcy process. I mean, there really is no way forward uh, until that happens. Uh, and I think one of the really important things about moving forward a process is uh, it will include an audit. It will force transparency. Now, it will not replace the work of the multi-sectoral audit committee, which we very much believe should be reestablished, should be refunded, uh, because uh, of the fact that it is multi-sectoral and it would look at the debt in deeper ways. But in terms of the next step, in terms of what has to happen really as quickly as possible is, is Title III being authorized. The longer we wait, uh, the more particular challenges we may face. Um, although I'm the moderator, I'd like to add to um, what um, Brother Ramirez just said. Um, we need to keep the pressure, even if we move to Title III. Um, our, our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico have, I cannot take another another 
measure of austerity is um, affecting everybody's life. And as it showed yesterday, people are ready to go out on the streets. Uh, when we went, when Detroit went to, uh, to, to bankruptcy, there was a lot of pressure from the communities there. And actually when it went to the judge, it, it made a difference, you know, the voice of the communities of Detroit. So we are working um, towards a similar goal. Any other questions for the audience? Are there any legal obstacles to, uh, to starting up with a, with Title III, or, or are they political? And if so, what are those obstacles? Any of the panelists like to talk about the promesa? Well, I think legally, um, the, they, they can go into court today to begin the Title III process. The oversight board would be the representative and prosecute the case, if you will, would be the, 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 the lead actor in the case on behalf of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Uh, under PROMESA, the government of Puerto Rico has to request the Oversight Board to initiate that case. Uh, so I think the, the, the obstacles may very well be political. Uh, when the governor requests the Oversight Board to act, he then kind of relinquishes control to a certain degree to the Oversight Board, because then the Oversight Board becomes the primary actor. In the Title VI process, in which we are still today, which is a consensual negotiation process, the governor is the principal in those discussions. So the governor could be preserving his own authority and, and, and ability to act by forestalling a Title III filing. Now with that said, we've already seen a couple of the creditor groups uh, begin legal action because the litigation stay has expired, right? So uh, as those cases proceed in the coming weeks, there'll be much more pressure on the government to go into Title III because you know, there's really not much of a case here for the Commonwealth. They're supposed to pay back bonds on a certain date and then they're due, and they haven't been making those payments for over a year. So to avoid a court order for payments, they're going to have to invoke Title III, which will once again reinstate the litigation stay, meaning that those court cases will be suspended and will all be moving into a Title III process. If, if they don't go into Title III, just to follow up Steve's remarks, you'll have various forms of chaos. Each one of these cases will proceed separately. They may be um, heard in different courts. You may have contradictory judgments. There's a general uh, presumption of sovereign immunity, but you can still get temp all kinds of strange temporary restraining orders coming out of courts. So th this is incredibly disruptive. So on top of all the other economic difficulties that we're discussing, you then have this very messy process across all kinds of economic activity uh, on the island that, it, that is just gonna hurt everyone. Um. I'd like to introduce um, right now con um, Congressman Jose Serrano. He represents New York's 15th district. He's the only congressman from New York City on the exclusive House Appropriations Committee and serves as ranking member of the Subcommittee on Financial Services and General Government. His largest concentration of Puerto Ricans in New York. Congressman. Thank you so much. That was incredible timing. I'm running over here. I almost got run over by the uh, Pence motorcade. <laughs> I saw him with a calculator trying to count votes for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be with you. And uh, I really have, first of all, to thank you for your time, to thank those who are not here, uh, from Puerto Rico for the time they're putting into this particular effort. Uh, we're all on the side of making sure that Puerto Rico comes out of this and comes out of this situation in a way where we can uh, all be proud. What I have to do today, what I want to do today, is to ask your opinion on something and to ask how you feel about something, and to ask, in all honesty, and it's not every day you're gonna get a congressman doing this, ask if I'm on the right track here. And that is that, as you know, there was a, uh, a bill that I, an amendment that I introduced to the PROMESA bill, saying that nothing done by the board could interfere with any work being done by the commission that was gonna look at the, uh, at the debt and was going to look at the uh, auditing of the debt. And uh, there seems to be questions as to whether that's going to happen or not. So I think that I've, I know that I've reached a point 
and my way of thinking that it's time to call publicly for a uh, audit of the debt. And to, I know that that has a lot of people who will cheer when they hear it, and a lot of people that will boo me loudly uh, for asking for it. But I, I think that the people need to know how this debt was incurred, what happened, what uh, did not happen, can it happen again, how can we make sure that it doesn't happen again. And I think that as long as that question is lingering over the heads of all of us, not only those that are trying to do something about the issue, but the people in Puerto Rico, there will always be that contradiction and that doubt. So I want to do two things today. First of all, take a step ahead and say that I'm asking for a, an audit of the debt to get to the bottom of how this came about. And secondly, to ask your assistance to tell me whether I'm on the right track, to tell me whether this is something that has merit or if I'm just uh, making a lot of noise here today. So it's a very simple situation, although I realize how complicated it can be and how difficult it can be. But I repeat, as long as this continues to be a question that is asked of me, ask of other legislators, ask of the Congress, ask of the Puerto Rico government, I think we need to have an audit of the debt and find out how this all came about. And what I'm asking from you is to tell me, am I on the right track here? And again, uh, this is a first. Usually members of Congress do whatever we think is right without asking an opinion, you know, and we sometimes run into trouble. Here, I want to do this, but I also want an expert opinion on can we accomplish something with this. Thank you. Any of the panelists would like to answer the congressman? Thank you, Mr. Serrano. Um, we very much believe there should be an audit of the debt. Uh, one of the reasons that we do support the Title III process uh, is in any bankruptcy process, it will force an audit, and that forces transparency, and that's absolutely important. At the same time, um, we believe that the defunding of the multi-sectoral audit uh, commission is a real problem because that, as you are saying, can look at the debt uh, in a much, much deeper way. So we believe it should be refunded. We believe that work should continue. It's absolutely, it's, it's actually globally historic that such a commission uh, was created. And if that commission cannot move forward, uh, I think uh, Congress has a role in terms of looking at how to audit the debt. I think Congress has a role um, in reintroducing bipartisan uh, principles on responsible lending and borrowing, not only to further prevent the next crisis in, in Puerto Rico, but to prevent global financial crisis all over the world um, that is connected to the U.S. financial jurisdiction. So in addition to an audit, we also believe that there are actions that Congress can continue to take to, not, to make sure that these problems don't happen in Puerto Rico, but they don't happen in other parts of our world as well. Thank you. I'd like to introduce now um, Representative Luis Gutierrez, who represents the Illinois 4th District. Now in his 12th term, Representative, Representative Gutierrez is the senior member of the Illinois delegation in the U.S. House of Representatives. He's a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and a fierce advocate of the people of Puerto Rico. Well, let me first begin by um, thanking all of the panelists um, for coming forward. I'm sorry that um, usual order here is if there are votes called, we get to go vote and then listen to the testimony. Um, I would have, I have read remarks. I would have loved to have been here while you gave those, uh, that testimony, but thank you for being here nonetheless. I came as quickly as possible after the votes here. Um, and um, I just want to, uh, just for the record, I think everybody should read this uh, very good article. It's in, it's in the nation. Uh, students are now leading the resistance to austerity in Puerto Rico. Some 40 billion of the island's debt could be illegal, so why is the government shutting down the audit commission? And I just heard you um, 
talk about the Congress. Congress isn't going to do anything about Puerto Rico. Let's, why don't we just be clear with one another? They got together, and they basically, like Pontius Pilate, washed their hands of Puerto Rico. I remember how many times here in this room and how many times on the House floor. Vote for this because it doesn't cost a cent. Vote for this because it doesn't cost a cent. When a government enacts legislation and people are in crisis, healthcare crisis, a crisis of jobs, a cri threatening the future, and your response is something that doesn't cost one cent, it kind of tells you how much will there is in the Congress of the United States to help the people of Puerto Rico. I think there's very little. Um, I'm happy to see um, even uh, $295 million. But as you know, Secretary Price said we need $900 million. So that's about four months worth of health care. So are the other two-thirds of the people of Puerto Rico just to be sick and not see a doctor and not get medicine? Or are we going to fully fund the health care system? But of course, PROMESA wasn't going to deal with health care in Puerto Rico. PROMESA wasn't going to deal with the fact that Puerto Rico has to ship and export everything in the most expensive manner possible. Wasn't going to deal with economic incentives that would have given people job opportunities. And PROMESA has not stopped the island and the fleeing of 5,000 people a month fleeing the island of Puerto Rico to the United States of America. And everybody thinks that it's just a panacea, that it's kind of like Disneyland, so why not go to Orlando? Puerto Ricans are not living in a Disneyland in Orlando or in the United States. They have to confront some of the same problems and some of the same issues that my mom and dad had to confront uh, back in the 1950s. And I think that's a pretty sad chapter. So I'd like to just, I don't know if we're going to enter for the record, but the nation's students are now leading the resistance to austerity in Puerto Rico uh, because how do you pay a debt without doing an audit? <laughs> it's the first time I've ever seen a government actually shut down an audit of what they owe. The government of Puerto Rico, the state legislature there said, no, we don't want an audit. We don't want to know who owes money and whether or not. Never seen such a thing before in my life. A total lack of transparency that exists in terms of what's going on. And I'd also like this great article, it's Associated Press article, Puerto Ricans protest on May Day as debt deadline nears. Uh, the May Day demonstrator denounced the U.S. Caribbean territory leaders, blamed a federal control board overseeing its finances for their economic troubles, and demanded an audit to identify those responsible for running up to $70 billion. In other words, we all agree it's $70 billion, but we're not going to f figure out how we got there and who might be responsible and whether that debt. And lastly, something that I think it's very important in the Atlanta, the historical exclusion behind the Puerto Rico bankruptcy crisis. And there has been an historical exclusion of Puerto Rico. On the upside, my mom and dad would have gone to jail under the Ley de la Mordaza had they said what members of Congress said from this podium. And that is that Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States of America. Had they said that? They would have said, a la cárcel, 1950, tú no puedes decir cosas semejantes, levantar una bandera de Puerto Rico, mucho menos. Y hablar en español, eso sería el pecado mayor. And speaking Spanish would probably be a major sin. Uh, in the, so my mom and dad would have gone, and yet the Congress of the United States recognizes that Puerto Rico is a colony, that they have complete plenary powers over the people of Puerto Rico, but then refuse to give them the tools to help them extricate themselves from the situation. And that PROMESA is nothing but more colonialism on top of colonialism. It should have been an opportunity for the people of Puerto Rico to move forward, but it wasn't. It was an opportunity wasted. And lastly, Puerto Rico hit with the first of several expected lawsuits from bondholders. Of course, the governor of Puerto Rico, the only power he has is the power to say when it is there's going to be a restructuring of the debt. And he keeps saying, well, I'm going to renegotiate with all these wonderful people on Wall Street and all these hedge fund managers. That's the only power he has, so he doesn't want to lose it. Because once he gives up that power, he has absolutely no other control over the economy, 
of Puerto Rico and over the legislative process. So he doesn't want to give it up. I can kind of understand that. But let's understand that many members of Congress voted for PROMESA under the pretext that it would reorganize the debt so that the people of Puerto Rico would not be burdened and crushed by that debt. And so I think once again we see the, the, that PROMESA, and then come on, guys, I mean, think about it. I used to always think when I was young, and I'd see somebody and they go, que mucha promesa huh? tiene ese individuo. Huh? Ese matrimonio presenta tanta promesa. Ese negocio se abrió y que prometedor ese negocio. O sea, promesa was always thought of what? Good things happening, right? The ability for things to change and transform and to get better and more wonderful. Pretty sad that we call this a promesa. And the people of Puerto Rico still, some of them think it's coming. Pero la promesa vendrá. Porque no harían una promesa al pueblo de Puerto Rico que simplemente trae. So there's been a lot of austerity in Puerto Rico, but a lot of little promesa. And at least we got 295. I want to thank uh, Nidia Velasquez and Jose Serrano and all the members of the Hispanic Congressional Caucus and everybody for coming together. And, and saying that we're gonna do something about the healthcare. But it's still only four months, and 20% of Puerto Rico's economy is healthcare, and we all know that the way Obamacare is structured, lasts. Look, the healthcare crisis in Puerto Rico is also a healthcare crisis because we sent $6 billion. We said, here, government of Puerto Rico, Here's $6 billion. When we were, I, I remember sitting there, and the, probably Jose Serrano remembers, sitting there with, uh, with President uh, Obama. And we were talking about Puerto Rico, and we are like, oh, we can't vote for this. And he said, oh, I'm going to sweeten it up. We're going to send $6 billion. Well, in a few months, the $6 billion are gone. Because the, people of, the government of Puerto Rico used to finance their Medicaid, that is their Mi Salud program. 65% of it used to come from state funds, and the rest came from the federal government. And what they did is they simply transferred it and continued to raise debt. So I want to thank you all for coming here. I don't have any questions. I'd like to make these articles part of the record and to say that um, to the extent we need to, uh, but I have to tell you, I am very, very proud of the students at the University of Puerto Rico uh, because they, are, they have shown such leadership in terms of saying no. We want a Puerto Rico. How are you going to shut down a university and take away $450 million away from a university and you're not going to create talent for the future of the island of Puerto Rico? You're going to suffocate it even more. They've really shown a lot of courage. And I know they've been demeaned and maligned in the press. But you know what? I'm proud of them. And I, I'm 63. I wish I was 23 so that I could join them. I'm so proud of them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman. I'd like to introduce now Representative Michelle Lujan Grisham. She represents New Mexico First District and is serving her third term. Representative Lujan Grisham was recently chosen by her colleagues to serve as chairwoman of the prestigious Congressional Hispanic Caucus. She serves in the Budget Committee and Agriculture Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives. I tell you, um, thank you for that very kind introduction. I always hate making remarks after Luis Gutierrez. And uh, I would uh, uh, suggest that that's how most members, either that or right after Jose Serrano. Um, and it should give an indication not only to the panel, not uh, I'm going to guess that you already knew that those sentiments, given that it's the, the caucus and thanks to uh, Grijalva for also leading on natural resources, which has jurisdiction. But we need to do more about being proactive and educating other members of Congress and their constituents about the issues that are affecting Puerto Rico. Because I don't... I, I know unequivocally that if I were to hold a forum in my district, too many of my constituents have no idea, and yet, in a much smaller degree, they face the very same issues. You know, we have this, uh, for the country, we have the state, uh, we have the worst uh, uh, economic outlook, we have the highest unemployment, we have more children living in poverty, we didn't fund right now, they, uh, they're, uh, they're in court in my state over a higher education budget that's been completely defunded by a veto of the governor who's looking 
looking at on a uh, austerity uh, set of uh, policies, restrictions, and a package for the next two years. And what it's done is it's driven out New Mexicans, including businesses and families. So what Puerto Rico has been dealing with, uh, and uh, in the same way, we're seeing play out in the same negative way in states who fail to either use the tools available to them or to have an aggressive stance about making sure that the investments are real and meaningful and create parity and equality in a way that they are intended to. So this forum for us is a, is a recognition that the issues that members for decades that have been fighting for, uh, that we have expand that review and partnership and think about other credible ideas and aspects that can help make Congress provide the kind of relief that in fact is meaningful. Uh, and while I agree with Luis that some of the uh, initial efforts are good signs, they are insufficient. Uh, and um, I'm just grateful that there are so many experts and so many incredible advocates and that I'm proud to be a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and I'm in a really unique position to get to lead uh, who I will tell you are the finest members in the Democratic Caucus who have been fighting and championing for the things that really make a difference for equality focusing on minority populations and Latinos and Hispanic populations, not just, not just in the territories in the country, but around the world, the globe. Um, and it makes me, I, again, it makes me very proud of that work. And uh, while I'm still disappointed that we're not at a place where we're championing every issue that we know today resolves these problems, um, I um, appreciate your time and energy and your effort to do everything in your power to make sure that we get there as quickly as possible. And I want to thank the folks who are also participating outside of the panel in the forum. Thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you very much for your efforts. And thank you for recognizing that this is a serious set of issues that require immediate attention by policymakers. Hold Congress accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Congresswoman, um, now we have Representative Norma Torres, who um, represents California 35th District, serving her second, her second term. Um, she was recently elected by her colleagues in the House of Committee on Natural Resources to serve as ranking member of the Indian Insular and Alaska Native Affairs Subcommittee. Congresswoman. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, today's forum is, very, is a very important one. Uh, the people of Puerto Rico face an urgent e economic and fiscal crisis brought on by a devastating combination of mismanagement, unfair federal policies, opportunistic and predatory hedge funds, and desperate budget cuts. The passage of PROMESA was the first step to give Puerto Rico relief from their crippling debt. However, I voted in opposition to the bill because I didn't feel that it did enough. I didn't support lowering the minimum wage for young workers, and I didn't support the lack of diversity in the fields of expertise from the board. For the Puerto Rican economy to grow, Congress and the Fiscal Oversight Board need to step up and assist the island further, in particularly with their health care costs and with their ability to attract investment and jobs. The island's deep-rooted economic and fiscal crisis cannot be solved through austerity economics. Puerto Rico is in dire need of a powerful dose of economic stimulus to bring quality jobs and higher wages and salaries. And it also needs help from Congress to achieve Medicaid, Medicare parity. We can't afford to step back and allow the island to suffer anymore. Thank you to our witnesses for being here. I look forward to hearing from you on the best approaches to provide Puerto Rico with the tools it needs to prevent more of the population from leaving the island because of the lack of jobs and crippling austerity measures. Thank you, Ranking Member Grijalva uh, for, and, and Chairwoman Grisham for hosting today's forum. My question uh, to our witnesses today is very simple. Puerto Rico um, government workers 
like AFSCME workers, have already sacrificed in prior cuts to wages, health care, pensions, uh, furloughs, and layoffs. What is the likely outcome of cuts in 2017? And did the recently certified fiscal plan include further furloughs up to 25% of the year? And what do you think this is going to do to these workers? One of the things that people don't know about Puerto Rican workers, especially police sector, most of them make around $25,000 a year. Out of that, 5,000 goes into contributions. So they're right above the poverty line in Puerto Rico. Any, any, any cuts, like uh, the one just introduced by uh, Bill 938 that uh, lowers the contribution for the health insurance is going to drive these workers below the poverty line. Cost of living in Puerto Rico is almost as twice as, uh, as the states. Most of the services that people get for free in the states, we have to pay for them. A lot of people make a lot of sacrifices to send their students to private schools because the public schools are underfunded. Teachers doesn't have the, 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 the materials need to give an adequate education. So any cut to the benefits or the salaries especially the furlough that we think is coming in the, uh, at the end of the year, will have a deep impact in the whole economic situation of the island because what we are doing is taking people money out of the pockets of the workers to give to the hedge funds. That's what we are doing. Every single dollar that we take out of the people of Puerto Rico is, goes out of Puerto Rico. And right now, the debt, the service to the debt is higher than the GDP, meaning that if every single Puerto Rico save the money that they get to pay the debt, we are not able to do it. Thank you so much. Any other comments? No. Thank you for being here today with us. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, last, we have um, Representative Darren, Darren Soto from Florida's uh, 9th District. Elected in 2016, Representative Soto serves at the House Committee on Natural Resources and is a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Congressman. Thank you for having me. I'm, I come from a place called Orlando, Florida. You may have heard of it. Uh, I have the honor of representing an area that is inextricably connected to the island. And we are absolutely cognizant of that fact. Um, I could tell you whether we're talking about the Hispanic community, including Puerto Ricans like myself, or we're talking about the African American community or the Anglo community in my district. We all understand the huge relocation of Puerto Ricans coming from the island. We also understand that while we welcome everybody to Central Florida and have done so much by way of building more schools and um, creating more higher institutions of learning like Point Santa Valencia and fighting for higher paying jobs in our high tech sector and in our healthcare sector, that every citizen who comes from Puerto Rico to Florida is at the expense of the island. And so we've had a lot of discussion locally about how important it is for the island of Puerto Rico to get back to prosperity because we believe that our two regions will both benefit from that. Uh, it was for that reason as well that I was applauded by all, all citizens in my district regardless of background for getting on the Natural Resources Committee and on the Subcommittee on Indian, Insular, and Alaskan Lands uh, with jurisdiction uh, over so many issues we face, whether it be PROMESA, whether it be status, or so many other issues people care about. And I heard a lot of ideas from my constituents, many of whom just moved or uh, who are elected in, uh, in Puerto Rico allies. Uh, first, it appears the way forward is first bringing power to the people. And one of the wonderful things we saw was the $295 million in Medicaid dollars. And I bring that up because it would have been zero. The Republicans never had this in the budget. It was going to be zero dollars, nothing for Puerto Rico and additional Medicaid dollars. And it was our democratic leadership through uh, 
Leader Pelosi and through Serrano and through Velasquez and Gutierrez and myself, as well as Congresswoman Nita Lowy, who forced this issue. It got up to the point where there were conversations with OMB and with Mr. Mulvaney, as well as the Speaker, to make this a priority. And I understand it's not as much as what everybody wants, but $295 million and it being one of the five or six points that the Democratic caucus fought for to get into the budget is significant. It shows a lot of people care about our plight. And if you really dig deeper, you'll see there was some cuts to other territories, like the Virgin Islands. There was a really awkward moment yesterday where we had to discuss some of the cuts that were made to the Virgin Island health care system in order to help fund um, the health care system in Puerto Rico. So although there's a lot of people who wish it was more, this was an astounding victory, being that in Congress it's so difficult to get anybody to pay attention to our island. I also think we need to have power to the people through making the child tax credit apply to more than just the third child onward. That was actually a Scrivener's error that uh, it makes no sense. Right now the federal government is encouraging Puerto Rican families to have three or more children. Like that, there's no public policy reason for that. It needs to apply from the first child onward so that we encourage Puerto Ricans on the island to have families, to make it easier, uh, and to give them tax incentives on programs that have actually worked for years. I also think that we need to apply the earned income tax credit, and it's something that we'll be continuing to push through the Hispanic Caucus. I realize it's Social Security and uh, Medicare that is being paid rather than the federal income tax, but this, these are programs that have helped millions of Americans, and I believe they'll help the people of Puerto Rico. I also will personally be working on trying to make a uh, pilot agricultural loan program through uh, the Ag Committee, because before the American before America ever took over Puerto Rico, and it was a takeover, uh, there were a whole myriad of small farmers throughout the island. That was the history of it. We had specialty fruits and vegetables that could only grow uh, in the United States and Puerto Rico, like mangoes and papaya and others that we can kind of grow in Florida, but it's done a little better on the island in many instances, as well as SBA loans for, for Puerto Ricans on the island to start small businesses. I really think that when we look at stimulus, we have to go to what is directly with the people and learn from the lessons of the past, which is not have top-down stimulus to major companies or any one particular industry and have it trickle down. It hasn't worked before, and I don't think it'll work again. And then in addition to power to the people, I think it's about having a reasonable path forward on the debt. I certainly sp support, along with uh, Congressman Serrano and, and, and Congressman Gutierrez and Congresswoman uh, Velasquez having an audit. I believe one of the panelists already talked about how that'll be triggered. Um, and we have debt relief that's happening under PROMESA. It appears that people may pay 25 cents on the dollar, which is a pretty good negotiating point. But we're also worried about other debts that are not in PROMESA right now, like PREPA, um, PRASA, and uh, the Puerto Rican Housing Finance Authority. Uh, we specifically had in our first Natural Resources Subcommittee meeting uh, that I get to serve on with Congresswoman Torres, a testimony about how non-PROMESA bondholders are put in an advantage to PROMESA bondholders, and that if we don't see better negotiating, that we will strongly consider rolling them in to the PROMESA negotiation so that everybody is put on the same level negotiating. I have two questions that I wanted to ask the panel. First, briefly, can each of you give us a good top three reasons why how this debt was created to begin with? And then my second question will go into PROMESA and, and how we what would you like to see out of the board? So the first question of the panel is, Give me the top two or three reasons why you think the debt built up like it did in Puerto Rico. Well, you know, I, I, you know, there's the obvious answer, right? Puerto Rico needed the money. And then the question is, why did they need the money? So you have to start with the economic decline. Uh, so it's really lack of economic activity, uh, which kicked off in part due to changes in the U.S. tax code. Right, the withdrawal of some of the, um, the tax preferences for doing business in, in manufacturing in Puerto Rico. Are you referring to the 936? 936, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you kick off there. Uh, and then, of course, there was a recession, and Puerto Rico's never recovered. And we've seen this happen in U.S. cities. Uh, we, we, we've seen these kind of shock, for instance, in Detroit. 
and you have a government and a need among people for services that's built on something bigger than your current revenues can maintain. So what happens is a government gets desperate for cash to kind of bridge itself from one year to the next. And as it gets more and more desperate, the folks on Wall Street figure it out and develop more and more complexity in the deals, more sophistication in the deals. It's harder and harder to figure out for everybody else. There's a lack of transparency. You start evading some of your statutory, and in Puerto Rico's case, constitutional protections on the issuance of debt, which is why we need an audit on the debt to kind of figure out how those got evaded. And it's, it's not too far to use, as, a, as an analogy, a crack addict, except Puerto Rico wasn't addicted to crack. It was addicted to cash to keep its budget intact so we could operate as a government. So I think you have you know, a conspiracy of bad things. Uh, lack of economic growth, in fact, economic contraction. You've got Wall Street predators who engaged in predatory, let, let's be very clear, it was predatory behavior. And if you look at the interest rates charged to Puerto Rico versus other municipalities and states, it's far in excess. So these bondholders knew exactly what they were getting into when they made these deals. They knew the possibility of being paid back was remote, and many of them dumped these bonds on their so-called customers because they very well knew that they did not want to be holding them themselves. So I think those, to me, are the two top reasons, economic decline and Wall Street predators. And of course, you could throw in lack of sophistication on the government's part for being, a, and maybe perhaps an unwitting, but certainly an accomplice in, uh, in what's occurred. Thank you. Does anybody else want to give a sort of top two or three reasons the debt accumulated? I agree with Steve. Okay. <clears throat> and also we can add the lack of health care funding par parity for Puerto Rico. It is estimated that around $20 billion of the debt is related to health care. So that's also an important uh, aspect of this crisis. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else want to add uh, another fundamental reason to how the debt accumulated? Because I think we need to have a full understanding from the experts like yourselves to have a real idea of how we can help. Uh, my second question is, what would be a top two or three actions you'd like to see the PROMESA board accomplish? Because we're on the oversight committee and we can help guide them and be very persuasive. So what would you all like to see the PROMESA board do? Well, one of the first things will be to stop the austerity measures. Stop what? The austerity measures. They are just hurting the people of Puerto Rico, and they are just keep making the situation even worse. The, what specific austerity measures? Uh, the cuts to, to workers' benefits, okay. the raises on taxes, uh, the measures to privatize poly owned corporations, and uh, every single thing that they can grab and they can sell. That's clear of, from the last meeting that uh, they have been now asked different entities from the government of Puerto Rico to see what can be privatized, either through direct sell or to the public partnership agreements. But one of the things that the, the, the Junta has to understand is that we need to go into the chapter three. Those 25 cents on the dollars, the economy in Puerto Rico cannot even sustain to pay that. Sure. That will mean, again, every single dollar that we can be using to revitalize the economy is going to go to the pocket of hedge fund uh, holders who bought maybe those bonds on 10 cents of the dollar, even less. So that's why we need an audit. We need to know who bought what and when and at one point at what price. Sure. Does anybody else have goals they'd like to see the PROMESA board accomplish? Well, I think, Congressman, the most important goal is to initiate Title III. To, to go into a court-supervised restructuring process, and it's remarkable that they didn't initiate this already, including last night and, and this morning. Well, I know every day Velasquez has talked quite a bit about when we're going to get to that. Every day, uh, there's a real and growing danger of disruptive litigation, which will further compound every single problem that we've been talking about, and it's completely unnecessary because the Oversight Board has this, this power or this responsibility. Now, I understand that one interpretation of PROMESA is we have to wait for the governor to ask, but I, I, I would question that, and I, would, I think put it back to, to, to Congress in terms of congressional intent. Uh, my understanding was, yes, the preference was for the governor to act, but if the governor refuses to act and the circumstances are as dire as they are today, the board can, by itself, uh, initiate the bankruptcy process. Well, a little insight into the subcommittee that uh, our ranking member was just here, uh, Congresswoman Torres, 
Uh, a lot of our peers don't have a lot of opinions on this. So they are open-minded to what those of us who are, are in states that are directly affected by this, including Florida. I could tell you, uh, Chair LaMalfa has been open-minded to what needs to be done. He even was nodding vigorously when I said we may roll in, we maybe should roll in the prep of debt into uh, PROMESA if we don't get a better negotiation. So there is a kind of an open-mindedness to these things. So these are some things I'll pass on to both uh, him and to Congresswoman uh, Torres on, on the matter. But uh, I think that we can push the label on our authority to encourage, if not um, push the PROMESA board to, to trigger three, if that's, if that's what um, folks are interested in doing. Here's, yeah. One of the, the issues is that the people who are being asked now on the board to fix the situation are corporates in the situation. For instance, Carlos Garcia was directly involved with Banco Santander in the issue of the debt. And now he sits in the same table for the people who are supposed to solve this situation. It's doubtful that he's going to step forward to try to save the interests of the people in Puerto Rico we ha when he has a lot to, ex to explain and to do. Right. And I share your concern about some conflicts of interest on the board and the salary of the executive director. The, what I'm torn with is if we keep on spinning our wheels and knocking people off and knocking off the executive director, it's like this balance between making sure that we have as best of board as we can and actually starting to get stuff done. So I'm, I'm equally torn with the stories I've read about uh, and ex excessive salaries and conflicts of interest, but I do want to see some things happen. And so, um, these are things we're looking at, but I could tell you that the, the, the need to act seems to be pretty dire, and three seems to be one of them. Uh, is there any other actions other than triggering three and executive salaries, uh, conflict of interest, uh, and, uh, and the audit that you'd like to see the Promessa Board do? Well, well, just on the point of the, the audit, which was, which was raised earlier, if you want to read what really happened in the financial crisis of 2008, one of the best documents to read is the bankruptcy examiner's report of the Lehman Brothers. So under the right circumstances, the bankruptcy, as this is point's been made by Eric mm -hmm. and others, the bankruptcy process and the bankruptcy examination within that process will tell you a lot of what you want to know and what you're asking for through. I know you want a separate audit process, but the bankruptcy process, if, particularly if the oversight board, as the litigant in that process, is asking for it and, and, and telling the judge why it's so important. Okay. Is there any other actions no. you'd like to see? Because this is my last question that I'm going to. Sure, and, and we appreciate. Else, but I want to know what the, you all want. Sorry, I'm sorry. We we appreciate the opportunity uh, uh, to to to, uh, to offer these suggestions. Uh, as I had said in, in my testimony, about a billion and a half dollars has been contributed by the workers to a retirement savings plan that they called a System 2000. Now they gave it a different name last year or two years ago, but that's a billion and a half dollars of the workers' own money into retirement savings that the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico spent to pay pension benefits it owed to other people. No one has addressed how to make workers whole for that money, which is their money. It would be like somebody going into your 401k account or and taking your money. Security. Right. Well, even worse, right, because this is a private, this is almost like going into a 401k and seizing that, those, those funds and using them for some other purpose. So that has to be addressed in our view, and workers have to be made whole, if not immediately in six months, of course, but there has to be a plan, and it has not been addressed in the fiscal plan, it has not been addressed by the governor, and it hasn't been addressed by the oversight board, and the oversight board should take responsibility for addressing it. Um, before I sit down, any other requests of what you'd like to see the PROMESA board do? Well, thank you, everyone. The only thing I'd ask is if we can get a, I know I have my staff back there taking rigorous notes, but it'd be great to get a, a summary sheet of just top lines of what you'd like to see them do, and we will compile it into a report for the committee. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, thank you also to Representative Torres Gutierrez, um, and special thanks to uh, Congresswoman Michelle Lujan Grisham and ranking member Grijalva for co-sharing this panel. Um, I'd like to ask Congressman Serrano if you uh, enjoy us with some closing remarks. Thank you very much. When you have a situation like the one Puerto Rico is going through, it's very difficult to say something good can come out of it. So I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say something positive can come out of it. I'll just say something different has come out of it, and I think 
you should know, and the people in Puerto Rico should know because it can be used to the advantage of Puerto Rico. This morning, for instance, at two different meetings, one of the Appropriations Committee, which I'm a member of, and one of the Democratic Caucus, Puerto Rico came up 10, 15 times. In the past, it would be five, 10 years, and you wouldn't hear Puerto Rico mentioned once, except when a member of Congress asked me to give him currency from Puerto Rico for his collection, so I give him a dollar from my pocket. Um, there is an opportunity here to deal with this issue and to set in motion the mechanisms that will prevent this from happening again. It means that Congress has to learn and be concerned about the role it plays. Congress cannot continue to tell the world how it must behave, democratically speaking, and then treat territories like an afterthought. I can tell you as a member of the Appropriations Committee that on many occasions in my early years, they know better than to tell me that now, whenever I asked for Puerto Rico or for any of the territories, I was told, well, we have nothing left. When in most cases, we were basically printing the money. We were not you know, balancing anything at any point. We know that. And I've always said, and people, Congress has to also understand, that when the United States, the 50 states, get a cold, Puerto Rico gets pneumonia. And that's just a fact. And so I want to thank you today and all these days for continuing to be with us. I'd like to make a personal note, and this is not to curry favors with two of the members of the panel, although that's not a bad thing to do, and that's this crisis has to be used to help the people of Puerto Rico. It cannot be used to destroy the labor movements. It cannot be used to hurt people who have been there in the past doing for Puerto Rico, putting up with a lot of the pain, having to tell their, their members how difficult it's going to be. Now, I know that somebody will write, Serrano was uh, being friendly to the labor movement, but that's who I am. I think that Puerto Rico's future has to be strong on all levels, and one of them is proper representation by labor, so no one should take advantage of this. And lastly, keep the people of Puerto Rico, all of you who are able to do so, informed that there is a discussion going on, that there are things that people are asking for. I'm asking for a publicly for an audit of the debt. That's something that a lot of people have mentioned here and there, but not publicly asked for. Nidia Velasquez is asking for some specific points. We've reached the point of no return, and we're okay with that. We've also reached a point where we've opened the doors. When I first got on the Appropriations Committee, the thought of $295 million, which is not what we need, but $295 million, specifically earmarked for Puerto Rico, was totally unheard of. So if you got the 295, there's no reason why we can't use that newfound attention, if you will, to get other things done that have to be done. But Puerto Rico also has to put its house in order. Puerto Rico within what is, and those of you who know Puerto Rico best know that there are things down there that have to be done so that this doesn't happen again. There's a lot here that has to be done. I find myself, and I close with this, in a unique situation, or a very, not a unique, a very sad situation. I was born in the colony in Mayagüez. I grew up in New York City. I now belong to the Congress that holds the colony. And so sometimes I feel like I'm causing myself problems. Uh, and I, and it, it can, can be something that people much brighter than I We'll have to figure out why Puerto Ricans act the way we do when it comes to Puerto Rico. It's because no matter whether we say it in English and Spanish on 138th Street in the Bronx or in Timbuktu, wherever it is, Puerto Rico is always special to us. And this Congress, as long as we're around, is not going to turn its back on it. And I promise you. And thank you so much once again. Thank you, Congressman. Um, in closing, uh, Puerto Ricans on the Islas have coined a slogan, which summarizes how many people feel right now. 
the slogan is first the people, then the dead. El pueblo antes que la deuda. In Spanish, thus summarizes our concerns. 110,000 people have demanded that the public debt be audited so we know how much, who, and how Puerto Rico got into this, and whether debt was issued illegally. We need this information to make the appropriate decisions on the basis of the effect in the life of the citizens. Even though Congress allowed for this in Section 413 of PROMESA, no one wants to do this. People die in Greece as a result of austerity-based cuts forced by lenders and Troika, which is our um, oversight board. So we are going uh, down a similar path. Cut to essential services, the increase of taxes, the abandonment of the country's infrastructure, the deprivation of rights, the abandonment of the project of economic development, unemployment, the dismantling of health reform, the increase of cr in criminality, the rampant mental health cases, the closure of schools and the university accreditation crisis are the signs of the times that people in Puerto Rico live, the despair is written on the walls of people's homes and on their faces. Neither the oversight board nor local leaders are equipped to deal with this. The oversight board cannot raise money. It cannot look to Congress for any financial assistance, including much needed Medicaid parity. Local political leaders in Puerto Rico don't have the tools to deal with this either. They do not have the tools to help jumpstart the economy, or they are making the wrong decisions by focusing on austerity. The economic plan of the current administration is privatization. It's nothing more than a fire sale of public assets. Even though everyone talks about Puerto Rico's government being too big, the reality is that Puerto Rico spends less per capita on government than most other states, ranking around 25th to 27th. When your sole income is $800 a month from social for a social security check that needs to cover your life basic needs, with the need to cover medication and treatment for chronic asthma and high blood pressure disease. When you recently graduated from college, with the only job opportunity in the service sector, with no opportunities for full-time benefits, we need to realize that further austerity will take us further into the abyss. I have a similar situation like Brother Ramirez explained earlier. My mother is also part of the pension fund. If the proposed cuts happen, she'll get $14,000 a month. How can you actually survive if you are also sick? She will suffer so the hedge funds and the banks get paid. A debt my mother didn't incur to. How, many mother, how my mother is going to survive on her own in this path? Puerto Rico needs economic growth, not economic cuts. I'd like to add, um, thank the panelists in today's um, uh, afternoon for um, joining us and those in the audience who were here um, and waited for the members of Congress to get here. Thank you very much, and I want to thank again Ranking Mega Rihal.